the next panel is going to be dealing with the economic economic rationales and the legal implications for keyword advertising restrictions. So here to talk to us about this today, firstly, uh, is Giuseppe Colangelo, and he is the Jean Monnet Professor of European Innovation Policy and an Associate Professor of Law and Economics at the University of Basilicata. Uh, and he's also a fellow at Stanford University Law School and adjunct professor of markets regulation and law at Luis and Legal Issues and Marketing at Bocconi in the university. So I'd like to ask Giuseppe now, uh, who will be presenting first the presentation, uh, to turn on your microphone and your camera. There you are. Thank you very much. Take it away. Thank you, Sally, for your introduction and thank you very much for having me. So the paper I'm going to present today uh, aims at addressing uh, a new potential clash between intellectual property and antitrust. We are pretty familiar with the controversial interfaces uh, involving copyright and patents. In this case, we are going to analyze the dangerous relationship between trademarks and antitrust. Uh, the uh, these scenarios provided by the growth of the commerce, the role of internet search engine and their keyword advertising services. Just to briefly describe how keyword advertising service works. Internet search engines enable individuals to find website online content through the use of keywords. When uh, an internet user performs a search on the basis of one or more words alongside natural results, uh, search engines displays advertisement uh, appearing under the heading of sponsored links, uh, while natural results are displayed on the basis of objective criteria determined by the search engine. Advertisements are triggered by because advertisers pay for their size to be, to feature in response to certain uh, keywords. Uh, looking at the most well-known keyword advertising service, that is the Google AdWords, advertisers are free to select any keywords against the payment of a fee for each click on the sponsored link. This is so-called paper link system, paper click system. Uh, since advertisers are allowed to purchase the same keywords, they beat competitively against each other for page position on the search results page. Uh, so in order to increase the chance to that a given advertising is, the, is displayed, sponsor may be interested in selecting trademarks as keywords, notably well-known trademark. So it comes no surprise that trademark owners complain the systems may um, negatively affect adverse uh, affect um, the essential function of, of, of the trademark and that litigation may arise around the use of someone else's sign as a keyword. Uh, just to briefly remind, um, function of a trademark include not only the essential function of indicating origin, uh, but also of guaranteeing the quality uh, of goods and services, those related to communication, investment and advertising. Indeed, we are actually witnessing an expansion of trademark rights to encompass non-competing goods on the basis of market preemption and free riding arguments uh, without any analysis of likelihood of confusion. Moreover, it cannot be disregarded that in terms of competitive effects, uh, there is significant room for depletion and overcrowding of trademarks. I mean that competitively, competitively effective marks are not limitless. Uh, the monopolization of particular terms uh, comes at the expense of both consumers and rivals. Uh, just to mention the latex example, we may take a look at the very recent U.S. Supreme Court in decision on the Booking.com sign. Uh, so against this backdrop, a restriction on keywords advertising justified by the alleged infringement of trademark function can also raise anti-competitive uh, anti -competitive concerns. Uh, indeed, keywords advertising is a tool to convey information uh, and is potentially able to divert traffic uh, and increase competition uh, among brands. Uh, therefore, trademark uh, holders may strategically enforce their sign in the keywords advertising scenario with the goal of restricting information online.
Okay, let me see if I'm able to. Okay, and as we may see from this slide, actually non bread binding agreements appear quite widespread. Uh, we can mention the European Commission uh, e commerce sector inquiry and in the aftermath, the gas decision coming from the uh, European Commission that will, deals with vertical relationships, so online restriction within selective distribution networks. The UK CMA investigates the uh, non breading bidding agreements in several industries from broadband to home insurance. The same has been run by the Dutch authority with regards with the hotel industry. And recently, uh, keywords advertising restriction has been also uh, under the lens of the US Federal Trade Commission, um, where they uh, challenged the, uh, an horizontal relationship, uh, trademark settlement agreements in the online contact lens industry. Uh, what I would like to highlight is mainly the insights coming from the Dutch and the British um, study. Uh, about the, uh, um, the Dutch authority investigation on the hotels uh, industry, uh, it's worth mentioning that they reported that by negotiating non-brand binding agreements with online travel agency, hotels can to some extent shield their own online sales channel against competition uh, from other hotels present on the hotel on the OTAs and they will be able to charge an higher price around 2% on the hotel's website relative to the OTA price. Even more interesting is the insight coming from the CMA because they address the different type of restriction within the brand, brand bidding agreements and their different potential impacts. Notably, they uh, report a difference between narrow and wide non-brand bidding agreements and difference between a narrow non-brand bidding agreements and negative matching agreements. Just to briefly describe, when we uh, talk about narrow non-brand bidding agreements, it means that the restricted advertiser agrees not to bid on another advertiser's brand name when the search terms only includes that brand name. If we look at the wide non-brand bidding agreements, it means that the search terms include both brand name alone and with other non-brand related words. If we look at the negative matching agreements, it means that the advertiser agreed to add another advertiser brand name to its negative keywords that uh, will prevents its advertising appearing when the search term include the brand name alone or with another non-brand related words. Well, according to the CMA, why non-brand bidding agreement and negative matching uh, agreements could affect the paid search results that consumers see in response to their search terms, uh, since they are likely to have a bigger impact on click-through and conversion rates. However, the evidence does not suggest that these agreements are currently, currently having a significant impact on consumers. And let's move to the next slide. Okay, uh, what about the insight that we may have from the trademark case law? Well, in the EU and US, uh, both the cards has highlighted the relevance of the, matcher, the manner in which the advertiser is displayed, because this is going to affect the way in which the average consumer perceives the message. However, it is relevant to highlight that there is a huge difference between EU and US. Because while in US there is no self-restraint in the uh, scope of the trademark protection, in the EU the legal assessment of keywords advertising is focused only on the question of whether rivals are confusing or informing customers. And notably, if we look at the two landmark cases, that is Google France and Interflora, we may see that within the keywords in the advertising scenario, the Court of Justice decides to limit the scope of trademark protection just to the origin function. It means that in Europe, if you were a trademark holder in the keyword advertising scenario, you cannot raise claim about free riding or you cannot complain about the damage of advertisement and investment function. And it is even more important to note that the Court of Justice reached this outcome referring to the need to safeguard the freedom of competition. 
Exp uh, explicitly, the Court of Justice stated that in condition of fair, co of fair competition that respects the trademark function as an indicator of origin, it cannot be allowed to a trademark holder to prevent competition from another, from user of, an, of the identical sign if he wants just to prevent advertising to put alternative goods or reduce its uh, advertising costs. So we have a definition of the scope of trademark within a trademark case law that affects also the way in which the keyword advertising may uh, produce anti-competitive effects. Um, so, but since the legal assessment of keyword advertising is centered, at least in Europe, uh, on whether competitors are merely confusing or informing customer, empirical investigation aimed at determining the effect of keyword advertising uh, on consumer behavior are of utmost importance. And so, let's see. Okay, and so I'm trying to sum up the main empirical studies that has been run in this field and uh, taking into account the difference between the informational or the navigational nature of the brand's research. The navigational ma nature means that a user is digiting a keyword because use is using a C keyword as a shortcut to reach a specific brand website, okay? Uh, so just to sum up the, uh, the studies that you may see over the slide, uh, despite different results about the navigational nature of brand uh, search and thereby on the capability of advertising on competitors' keywords to divert significant share of traffic, the empirical studies seem to share a common view about the limited risk of consumer confusion generated by competitive advertising on brand search suggesting that the nature of competitors' click is more consistent with the informational deliberate search rather than navigational one. And so when we, re when we, come, okay, when we come to the, uh, sorry, I have a problem to switch the slide. When we come to the uh, antitrust analysis, we may see some difference between EU and US. The main uh, UK, UK cases are related to vertical relationships. It means that um, previously in the common sector inquiry and then in the, aftermath, in the aftermath of this sector within the guest decision, the European Commission challenged restriction coming from manufacturer toward uh, retailers within selective distribution networks aimed at reducing the visibility of the retailer website not to avoid the risk of confusion, but just to reduce the cost of manufacturer advertising. And according to the uh, European Commission, this, is, this should be treated as a restriction by object because it's not in line with the scope of the trademark as has been assessed in Google France and Interflora. So since there are no risk of confusion, a manufacturer is not allowed to restrict the ability of retailer to appear over a search engine. Uh, if we move to the uh, US scenario, uh, the US scenario is different because the uh, Federal Trade Commission address a trademark settlement agreement, that is an horizontal agreement. And it took into account also the, also the type of restriction within this agreement that is related to a negative uh, keywords restriction. Um, he also uh, considered the fact that the agreements did not limit the, the ability to advertise through other media and did not prohibit parties from bidding on generic keywords such as contact lens. However, the Federal Trade Commission decided to treat this agreement as inherently suspect, that is a quasi per se violation. Uh, and no matter the fact that the agreements, uh, the settlement agreements were not baseless, were not shames, and no matter the fact they acknowledged that the trademark holder had a brand identity that is wished to preserve, uh, the main reason 
reasoning of the Federal Trade Commission decision seems to rely on the so-called weak uh, intellectual property right argument. So due to the fact that previously the trademark order was unable to succeed uh, before Cards in his likely of confusion claim, uh, they, they, they believed that these trademark uh, settlement agreements uh, were aimed just to shield a weak intellectual property right. That if you look, if you take into account this kind of reason, you may see that this decision resembled the act of his decision. Actually, the patent settlement agreement that has been judged both in U.S. and EU in the pharmaceutical sector. And with regards to this last scenario, uh, I want just to highlight main difference uh, about trademark settlement agreement and patent settlement agreement. I'm still struggling to show the slide. Okay. And just to sum up the main difference, and that's the reason why I have some concern in mirroring the treatment of patent settlement agreements also in treatment settlement agreements. First of all, we have to recognize that there are huge differences in terms of economic rational function uh, between patent and trademark. Moreover, if we remind the framework in which has been analyzed the patent settlement agreements, uh, that has also been labeled as reverse payment uh, settlement agreements. They have been investigated, they are investigated due to the fact that they are going to delay the launch of new programs. This is not the case in trademark settlement agreements. Reverse pharmaceuticals payment settlement agreements are so-called byproduct of regulation in the pharmaceutical industry. That is the reason why they are also called as a perfect storm for regulatory, regulatory gaming. In trademark settlement agreements, there is no rule for regulation. Uh, in trademark settlement agreement, the validity of the underlying intellectual property right is not disputed. Well, while in the patent settlement agreement, it, this is one of the main concerns. Uh, moreover, uh, the existence of a resource payment is doubly suspect because the transfer of value is coming from the patent holder toward the alleged infringer, while in the trademark settlement agreement, actually the transfer goes in the usual direction. And finally, the size of transfer that is, is of utmost importance is the antitrust evaluation of the pharmaceutical patent settlement, and settlement agreement play no role, play no role in the trademark settlement agreement. So for all these reasons, I have some concern in supporting the Federal Trade Commission decision in mirroring the patent settlement agreement framework also in the trademark keywords advertising settlement agreements. Uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, because of the expansion of trademark protection and the increasing role play played by keywords advertising service for online shopping, actually facing a new potential clash between intellectual property rights and antitrust law. However, this time, following the European Court of Justice judgment, we will not need to craft new exceptional circumstances to justify antitrust intervention. Indeed, at least in the EU, the scope of trademark in keywords advertising scenario has been determined by reference to trademark law, notably, notably by limiting trademark protection to cases in which only the origin function is a factor and restoring the so-called primacy of confusion-based rationale. For this reason, unlike the U.S. approach, I do believe that the European one is better suited to ensuring a balance, a fair balance between the interests the interest at stake. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Uh, and I can will ask now, Elias, when you turn on your mic, Elias Dauscher here, who you see now, he is a, a lecturer in competition law and IP at the University of East Anglia. Uh, research speciality is competition to play between competition and intellectual property law. Uh, so we're now going to hear a response from him. Elias, uh, you have 10 minutes if yeah. we can uh, okay. allow for, for some questions at the end. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to comment on Giuseppe's very, very interesting paper and also to share some of my thoughts on online search advertising or online keyword advertising restraints. 
And first, I'd like to really congratulate Giuseppe to this uh, very fascinating paper, which puts forward a comprehensive analysis of the economic and legal issues surrounding the competitive use of trademarks in uh, search advertising. And Giuseppe does so from the trademark law perspective and the competition law perspective. So this is already very, very enriching. And moreover, he also looks at it from a comparative approach and he looks at EU and US trademark and antitrust law, which makes it even richer. And what I also really appreciate in his paper is that he uh, looks at a solution and he tries to find out a solution how we can reconcile um, trademark law and, and competition law here. And he suggests that to some extent the European Commission, by looking at the scope of the trademark and, and the confusion uh, rationale, um, did the right thing in, in order to decide when um, vertical restraints on, on the competing use of trademarks are in line with competition law and when they are problematic. So Giuseppe to some extent suggests that um, if we assess whether an agreement a restraint on the use of, of keyboard advertising is geared towards the protection of the origin function of the trademark or if it's um, trying to reduce the likelihood of confusion, then it's okay under competition law, but when it goes beyond this goal, then it's problematic. And I find this really a, a very fascinating idea, but I'm also uh, wondering if we uh, can discuss some of the questions that I have about this idea in the following. So first of all, I'm wondering whether uh, you, Giuseppe, you think that the uh, scope of the IP right test really facilitates anal the analysis uh, from of these uh, vertical restraints under competition law, or whether it perhaps also might complicate the competition law analysis. Secondly, I'm also wondering whether you would suggest that uh, we should look at vertical online search advertising restraints, such as in the guest case that you mentioned, for instance, and horizontal uh, restraints between competing brands in the same way, or should we analyze it differently? And the third question that comes to my mind and came to my mind when reading your paper was really also the question, did the European Commission get it right in, in guess by saying um, vertical non-brand bidding agreements are by object restrictions, or should we perhaps rather look at them from a by effects analysis? And to illustrate that the, the questions that I have and why, why I'm raising these questions, I, I'd like to, to uh, come to uh, my own research, which looks currently at the at these vertical non-brand bidding restraints. I'm, and I'm suggesting that we should look beyond trademark law to assess the competitive impact of those restraints. And I would suggest that it would be fruitful to really, for a competition authority, but also economists and, and, and lawyers to think about why would a brand owner ever want to restrict online search advertising by its distributors. Because first of all, this might actually be quite counterintuitive as a strategy for the brand owner, because it might lead to less sales of its branded products by its distributors who invest less in advertising. And secondly, if the brand owner wanted to maximize its profit, uh, it could simply charge the retailers a higher wholesale price instead of trying to channel consumers to their own online sales channel. So, I would tend to argue that we need a better understanding and empirical analysis of the economic rationale and the welfare effects underpinning those vertical non-brand bidding restraints. And the first reason why I suggest that we have to understand this a bit better is because I have the impression that we have not get our heads around the interplay between search and display advertising, especially when it comes to competition between brands. So there is currently a lot of man uh, management literature and also recent reports also by the CMA who observe that display advertising is actually crucial for what you can see here on the right hand, the creation of the brand awareness of amongst consumers and also the, in the end that the creation of uh, or the shaping of, of their preferences, whereas search advertising only 
uh, interacts with uh, the consumers at the very uh, last um, step of their so-called conversion funnel when they make a, a purchasing decision. So from this perspective and in light of this literature, one could argue that display advertising is really crucial for inter-brand competition. So for, let's say, the competition between Gas and Levi's and uh, other, uh, other jeans brands. And at the same time, what is problematic for a brand owner is that display advertising, while being much more important for inter-brand competition, is less effective than search advertising. So search advertising generates a higher return on investment, especially for retailers. And the consequence is that the, uh, this, the in, in, in a distribution network, uh, there is the, the problem for the for the brand owner that retailers might actually overinvest into search advertising and underinvest in display advertising. And from this perspective, vertical restraints on keyword advertising might actually be an important um, an important tool to to regulate the amount of advertising within the distribution network and also to address some of the free riding that might um, that might emerge if, for instance, the retailers um, benefit a lot from display advertising by the brand owner. The second reason why I would suggest that we should look more at the economics of those um, vertical non-brand bidding agreements is because there's a growing literature, economic literature, which should, which suggests that information restraints might actually um, help brand owners to organize or to, to, to orchestrate price discrimination across the distribution network. And this might allow brand owners to recover important fixed costs, for instance, for display advertising or investment in the reputation of a brand. And to illustrate this claim, let's assume for a moment that we have heter consumers with heterogeneous um, preferences for a specific product, let's say jeans, for instance. So you have one customer group which has a very high willingness to pay for a product. And let's assume also that those customers have high search costs. So they are very busy and therefore don't like to search for a long time on Google to find, let's say, the jeans that Guess offers. And let's assume there's a second customer group which has a lower willingness to pay, but also lower search costs because they have higher budgetary constraint. They have a higher willingness to actually search around in, on, on Google, search around in the internet to find uh, a better deal. And what the problem is for a brand owner and its retailers is that it's very difficult for them to actually observe who are the high value customers and who are the low value customers. So this might lead them to a situation where they have to choose between an imperfect alternative of either charging a very high price, which is equal to the willingness to pay of the high value customers, but this might actually um, lead to lower um, sales and will price out the low value customers from the market but it allows them at least to, to extract the surplus here. Or the brand owner and the distributors actually choose um, to, to set a uniform price at the uh, low willingness to pay of the low um, value customers. And this allows them to serve all the, um, all the consumers, but uh, it doesn't allow them to extract the surplus here. So against this backdrop, the vertical uh, non-brand bidding restraints might actually be a way that would enable brand owners and the distributors to engage in brand dis uh, in, in price discrimination across their brand. Because vertical non-brand bidding agreements create to some extent search costs and search friction and thus might operate as filters to segregate the high value customers who will directly go on the first link uh, first sponsored link on Google and then channel, be channeled to the online store of the brand owner, in this case, for instance, guest.eu, um, where they can be charged a premium and the low value customers will click through the generic search results, for instance, or use other brand name, uh, other keywords, which are not brand names on Google and will be uh, guided to, to other retailers who are 
uh, selling at a non-premium uh, price or at a lower price. And from this perspective, online search advertising restraints might allow especially brand owners to engage in this surplus extraction without, however, um, reducing the quantity sold. It might The surplus extraction might allow them to recover fixed costs, especially for display advertising, and it might also lead to, on average, lower prices for consumers um, as compared to uni uh, uniform pricing, and it might um, give enough um, enough uh, investment incentives for brand, brand owners, especially, to invest in brand reputation and quality. So I feel very briefly uh, set out two potentially pro-competitive explanations for those vertical non-brand bidding restraints. And of course, I agree also with the analysis uh, that Giuseppe puts forward in his, in his uh, paper and with the commission's decision in the guess uh, case that there are potential anti-competitive effects. And what I'm wondering and what I'm struggling with is also the question, so how can we, uh, under competition law analysis, account for both the pro and anti-competitive effects of these restraints? And I, I think an interesting way of doing so would be to follow some of the recommendations that the CMA makes uh, in its uh, paper year analysis of, uh, of those um, restraints. And I think I stop here and in order to have a, a fruitful dis discussion on, on Giuseppe and my uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both for both sticking, sticking excellently to time. time. Uh, uh, and I was um, wondering if maybe we could let uh, Giuseppe have a word first in response, yeah. since there were th three specific questions that you posed, Elias, to him. Uh, and then we'll um, open it up if we have time. Uh, if you do want to ask a question, please use the raise your hand button, and I will try to keep scrolling through and seeing who has a hand raised. <laughs> Giuseppe. Okay, great presentation, several very interesting feedbacks. Uh, I'll try to address uh, at least some of the question about the uh, facilitating or complicating uh, effects of this uh, focus on the scope of IPR. Uh, IPR. Uh, I, be I do believe that restricting, restricting the scope of the trademark is helping competition law analysis. Uh, that not, does not mean that necessarily it makes me more uh, it makes me more uh, efficient, but is definitely is facilitating because you do not run the risk that competition authority has to craft the exact scope of an intellectual property rights or build a new scope of the intellectual property rights. So when it comes to uh, find a coherent way to address the interface. I do believe that it's better to take into account how the intellectual property uh, studies and case law define the scope of the underlying APR. And actually, it's, that's what is going to happen, is happening in EU with, with trademark, just with trademark. But we may mention also other cases in which the European uh, Commission and the European Court of Justice deciding antitrust case took into account the way in which the trademark has been uh, restricted online. Uh, we may mention the Coty Prestige case, when the discussion was about the restriction on the on uh, marketplace platform for specific type of goods. And then they decide to look at the way in which the selective distribution system works, uh, um, recalling the way in which the other trademark is justified within the selective distribution uh, system together with the other legitimate criteria. And so they are allowed to manufacture some type of restriction when this, in order to enable them to control the retailer website. And so they are allowed to forbid to sell specific brand on third party marketplace because they run the risk to um, to lower brand reputation. So I do believe that actually European Commission repair cards of justice are within the trademark online scenario are trying to take into account the specific scope of trademark and to strike a fair balance. However, 
I do agree uh, with Elias about the, the need to distinguish vertical relationship with horizontal one. And when it comes to horizontal one, uh, the, um, the confusion-based rational, the fact to limit manufacture to rely on free riding, on advertisement and investment function, maybe is even more useful for uh, antitrust authority because otherwise it's pretty difficult to challenge a settlement when there is a ground for litigation because it's pretty easy to um, have a litigation based on a free riding issue when you are a, a well-known trademark holder. So it would be pretty difficult to say that this settlement is anti-competitive because your trademark is weak. If you are a well-known trademark holder, your trademark by definition is very, very strong. So if you do not restrain the scope of the trademark, you will allow the trademark enforcement in any kind of situation. So probably helping also strategic behavior. But what I really do believe that, and I agree with Elias, is that we have to take into account the specific restriction within this agreement. So the CMA study and the difference between narrow wine and negative matching um, agreement should be taken into account. Uh, and probably they will play a huge role in the horizontal uh, dynamic rather than in the vertical one. But Elias bring us several very interesting um, suggestions, points, and I will think about it. Thank you. If anyone has a question, please, we can have one in the in, uh, type it into the chat, and I'll be happy to pose it to our speakers. Or do we have any questions? We have five more minutes. So if you want to jump in with a question, otherwise I will put one forward. Um, and I'm wondering if there is um, any kind of uh, interaction or parallel in terms of uh, um, the display. Um, and uh, if you could sort of expand a little bit um, on the, what would be the, I guess the competitive relationship when we're dealing with resellers, et cetera. I think Elias, you had mentioned it in yours, taking that into somehow an account. Uh, we have a question about the papers being shared on emails. I think we can. Um, I know Giuseppe's is on SSRN. Uh, and when you see the recording, the link for it is at the beginning of his um, presentation as well. Elias, you want to jump in? Um, yeah, just with respect to your question about the display advertising. So, to, to, uh, to my understanding, the for competition between brands, display advertising, at least what you can see um, from the studies that I've mentioned and also the CMA um, interim report on, on, on digital advertising, uh, display advertising plays actually a much greater role for um, for um, the competition between brands, or so-called inter-brand competition, whereas search advertising is rather taking place between the dis uh, or stimulating competition between the distributors of the very same brand, so within the the brand and so-called intra-brand competition, and from a competition law perspective and a competition economics perspective, normally competition law and, and economists are more concerned about inter-brand competition and they tend to accept um, certain restraints in intra-brand competition if they allow firms to, to be more dynamic um, or to, to increase the investments of the dis distribution network uh, with respect to inter-brand competition. And um, therefore, I, I would suggest that we shouldn't concern to be uh, or sh shouldn't be too concerned about search advertising restraints if they allow firms 
and brand owners to invest more um, in display advertising, for instance, by uh, reducing the this, this search advertising costs and uh, thereby uh, to invest more in inter-brand competition. And I'm, I, I'm quite puzzled by the European Commission's decision in, in gas uh, for not taking this into account. Okay, I, I would like to see more investment in display as well, because that's the kind that actually fund the uh, media that we actually need to have <laughs> in order to, to survive as societies. Um, I don't, I have a question about the papers being shared. Um, and uh, if I don't have another one, um, I think I can close this. I'll throw out one last thing to think about, and that is that um, the, the whoever places the ad gets the data based on the placement and the response by the consumers to the ads. So there's another element of competition in terms of control over who gets to place ads in search because they're also there there's a feedback of data based on the, the placement. So by limiting others' ability to place ads using your trademark, you're also limiting their ability to gather information on their consumers. Um, that might that might be um, another dimension outside of your IP stuff, but <laughs> another thing to think about. Um, uh, and on that note, um, I'm going to hand it back to Sean. Thank you both for a very interesting discussion. Giuseppe, thank you uh, for thank you. presenting your work, Elias, for thank responding. You, I hope you two will continue the conversation. Uh, and Sean, uh, would you like to make a few closing remarks for today? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll just jump in. Thank you very much, Sally, for uh, and uh, uh, to uh, to all the speakers we've had today, as well as the audience for for participating. I just like to make one uh, linking point between the two sessions because uh, actually, I I I think it's uh, uh, there is there is actually there is a link. That, that we could find between keyword advertising and the MFNs. Uh, the MFNs in the hotel industry, for example, tend to be justified by the uh, by the platform for the reason that the platform wishes to uh, to avoid free riding on the platform. So hotels might use uh, the platform as a way for customers to find out about the hotel and then uh, and then gain uh, uh, direct sales. Um, if it charges a lower price than is available on the platform, so that that's a free riding argument. I wanted to to kind of turn that around a little bit and just just ask a question, which is: uh, suppose that a hotel estimate. Uh, uh, goes through the process of making substantial investments and building up its own brand name and trademark, a bit like Dirk was mentioning, uh, we need to think about uh, investment uh, at times. And, and suppose the hotel makes these investments and then somebody searching for that hotel on the internet ends up going to booking.com. Could the hotel argue that booking.com or, or one of the other OTAs is in a sense uh, free riding on the investments, uh, perhaps, and and so just just wanted to throw out a hypothesis that this is uh, the free riding can go in both directions potentially, but uh, but I'm sure it's it, it might be larger in in uh, in one direction than another. I don't have a strong intuition as to which uh, which direction would have the largest move, but I did want to raise that point. Also wanted to mention that tomorrow. Uh, we will be having a session on agency that uh, that will follow up on some of the points that were made uh, today. Uh, we'll also be talking about data and exclusives and differentiated treatment. Um, and I do hope you'll be able to join us tomorrow. I found today's sessions to be really interesting, engaging. Um, uh, some some quite uh, quite valuable points uh, made that I hadn't thought about before, and I hope some of you found the same experience. So thank you very much for joining us today, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the two days to come. Thank you.